This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. Fast to freedom, Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for November 2nd, 2022. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network feed or our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes to get you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one time or reoccurring donation. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears, joining alongside KS Lowe. And I would like to apologize in advance for our listeners this week. I got back from uh, uh, from New Orleans on Halloween, and I have know my voice has been thrashed. So I, I, I'm going to play through it, KS. I got the tea here for me. But how are you today? Mike, if it makes you feel any better, I did not notice until you brought it up. And quite honestly, as you were talking after you said something, I still couldn't hear a difference. So I think you're doing okay. Let's see how we are when we get to hour two tonight, because this is our big Gate of Destiny preview show. Okay, so we've been stoked about this show for weeks now, and we're going to get into it. We're going to preview every match on the show. But first case, we have some Dragon Gate in USA and uh, YouTube stuff to happen to go through. So, Case, what, what, do, what reached out to you over the last week in Dragon Gate stuff? No TV, so well, what did you seek out and what were you enjoying? Yeah, so I'm sorry. Jeff Jarrett's on my TV right now, and I'm really annoyed by this. He's I still just, on TV? I just... Look, AEW, I I get that Shima can't come in. I just want, like, cool six-man tag matches in the first hour and then big main events in the second. Why the fuck is Jeff Jarrett on my TV? I have no interest in this whatsoever. Did he get fired again from WWE? I didn't. I didn't know he was fired. Yeah, I mean, boy. Uh, real, real quick, real quick. I, I just, I was thinking about something earlier today. I don't remember specifically what it was. I think I'm going to think of it as we talk about it on this podcast because I remember the prevailing thought being like, oh, old heads in our bubble, you know, people that have, have been around for close to a decade like myself now, we remember this and certain people don't. I I don't remember what that specific thought was, but I am now thinking about how Jeff Jarrett almost single-handedly sparked the New Japan and America craze because he had the brains to attach Global Force's name to Wrestle Kingdom 9. And I don't feel like like that gets talked about enough. Dude, it, it it is something that, like, we're getting that distance that, like, you know we're five years from the Flow Slam closure? Five years. Oh my! Oh, we gotta, we gotta go drinking. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta <laughs> celebrate the closure of Flow Slam, dude. It, it, it was something that like it, it, we are like entering like a time that. So like I was doing the uh, Spears of Asians weekly show earlier today because of our change schedule, and I was looking up stuff about Fight Plus, and my mind naturally went to Flow Slam because I mean that's like the one to one thing there, and. Just like all the memories that kind of flash back with me along the same ways of, hey, uh, Jeff Jarrett like had his connections with pay-per-view providers and managed to weasel his way onto Wrestle Kingdom. It's incredible. And, and that was, you know, the the uh, the great Tanahashi Okada match where everybody thought Okada was going to win. And then Tanahashi won and Okada cried. That was Ibushi versus Nakamura, which is probably one of the. It will easily one of the 10 most important matches of the last decade. I would certainly hear an argument that it's one of the most five important, uh, five most important matches of the last decade that 
that Ibushi versus Nakamura match just changed. It changed everything. It's like that Okada Tanahashi, Ibushi Nakamura, the first Okada Omega, which I I mean is probably the most game changing match of the 21st century. That's that's the list. I don't even know what comes after that. That might be the top three. And then Jericho Omega, just because Tony Khan watched that and saw an idea, but I don't, none of that happens without Okada Omega. And, you know, none of that happens without the two uh, great Wrestle Kingdom nine matches. So I guess, thank you, Jeff Jarrett is my roundabout way of saying that. Yeah. It, it's something that now that you're bringing that up, uh, I'm thinking about like, so like new Japan world, like already existed, I guess, or there was, there was like the new weirdness. Japan world launched in December of 2014. I believe it was December one, 2014. So rest, that was the first Wrestle Kingdom on right. world. Yeah, but I remember, like, the thing was, like, the English feed was only going to be over pay-per-view. So my friends were still kind of normie about that kind of stuff. Like, they, like, they like wrestling things, but they weren't, like, like, they weren't, like, diving in for that kind of stuff. So we all pulled it together to watch that pay-per-view. Like, I already saw stuff, like, the night before, and I was, like, vibrating throughout the day. I was like, oh, we have to rewatch this. You get ready for this. Get ready for this. And it just was, like, one of those shows that, I, I I think in one way, like WrestleMania 30 gets like marked as like this milestone moment just for like a lot of different things. But Wrestle Kingdom 9 has a lot there that I think like reverberated throughout the industry, I would argue, in a way more than WrestleMania 30. Well, WrestleMania 30 is a bad show. I mean, tw- I, I think 29 is the last WrestleMania that felt like the biggest wrestling show of the year and not like this gross over the top eight hour extravaganza by 30 those those that that was a bad show i don't i mean i didn't like the daniel bryan triple h match and i certainly didn't like the triple threat match which goes along with my prevailing theme of i've just i've always been not even a quarter star closer to a half star if not a full star lower on daniel bryan specific matches than other people but there's nothing else worthwhile on that show other than uh claudio winning that battle royal which was cool and then went nowhere yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one of those things that, like, when the narrative or, like, when the leading promotion can just, like, write the history and the people just accept it and not have, like, the actual history that kind of, like, peaks in there in a little bit and in a kind of way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, okay, let's let's talk about Dragon Gate. We started late because <laughs> Mike, and I, Mike and I were getting into minutiae uh, 2022 media details before we started on this call, a, a conversation that would bore everybody listening. So we're already a little bit behind of where I was planning on being tonight. But there was a bunch of Dragon Gate YouTube uploads over the weekend. They had, I think, four house shows in a row. They ran a ton of shows this week, even if none of them hit Dragon Gate Network itself. And more importantly, or rather most importantly, on October 27th, we had the first vocal crowd on a Dragon Gate show in two and a half years. I watched the YouTube uploads. There were three matches uploaded. It was a Gold Class versus Natural Vibe six-man, Masaki Mochizuki versus Konomami Chikawa, and a six-man main event of Madoka Kakuta, Yuki Yoshioka, and Takashi Yoshida versus Big Boss Shimizu, Jackie Funky Kame, and Strong Machine J. Yeah, it is something that these were it, – it, it was interesting to see the, the way they did this. This wasn't really announced. This was in uh, Nanao, and it they had gold class and naturalized bringing everyone in. And it was one of those things that, at least to me, case, like all the all stuff is worth watching. Like even the uh, the soccer Chikawa match, if only for the thing that they – you get to see them like do the house show soccer match. You don't know, always get to see that, so that was really cool. But up until the, uh, uh, really up until the, uh, the the final match, up until the main event, like the crowd, they were getting into it. But I could tell that like, maybe this was sprung on them, and they weren't, and they were a little bit surprised in a way because like this is like spontaneously happened, right, Kiss? I, I was unaware of this being a vocal crowd show until after the results were posted. That was all new information to me, and that tentativeness goes along with the Torimon reunion show when Ultima went rogue, nearly got them banned from Cork and Hall, and had to talk to the police about it, where Ultima said you can cheer, and it took it took the crowd a minute to get going, and then once they got going for the short time that they were vocal, they were pretty loud. Here, it seemed like there was sort of uh, with all three matches that ended up hitting the YouTube channel, sort of a progressive uh, build from the crowd. And they were they were super hot for that main event. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about it on this show 
of recognizing that even with the limitations that are imposed with all wrestling promotions in Japan right now, hey, there's something there with D-Courage. Yuki Yoshioka is really over as a champion. Dragon Daya is really over as a babyface. And Madoka Kakuta, in such a miraculous turn of events after having a a lackluster and wandering spring and summer, found his stride in August with D-Courage and was really able to turn what could have been years and years of meandering had he just wasted away in the mid-card he accelerated to, you know, now he's, you, you know, an upper mid card guy. He's an open the Twin Gate champion. And him as the third piece of that D Courage act works in ring and it resonates with the people. And that really came through in that main event. And I think, especially so, so after the main event, when it was the winning team of D Courage and Yoshida doing like the mic talk, it was mostly Yoshi, it was mostly kakuda and he was like carrying it it was something i was like wow all right and everyone was like laughing along with him it's something that was really cool that that match was kind of like the main event of the first voices okay show and especially as this match went on i thought it was really kind of cool like they went to the jfk and kakuda thing for the finish and then the audible gas for the snap pile drive finish like it was something it's like oh yeah he's got the stuff there and the crowd's buying into it and that was really really neat to see yeah, D-Courage is just hitting on all levels. We talked a few weeks ago about the merchandise that they're moving. It also, you know, I, I think part of my excitement for Gate of Destiny, one, I just, I think the show looks great and and I'm going to watch it live. I'll be live tweeting from the Open the Voice Gate account and I'll have a review up pretty shortly on VoicesWrestling.com as well as the same day audio that we're going to do for that show. I'm excited for it because the card looks good. I'm excited for it for the vocal crowd and I'm excited for it because... I, and I, I've talked about this a little bit, but, you know, we left Kobe World in this pretty uncertain period. Fujiwara and Estrella were gone. SB Kento was leaving. You had, you know, whatever backstage things were happening or weren't happening and who said this and who's doing that and who has power where. And then we also had this looming Yamato trip to America and this looming Shun Skywalker trip to America. And were more guys going to leave? All of these things were sort of up in the air. And, and we talked about how we know they can land on their feet in 2023, but we don't know what the final months of 2022 will look like. And I think you and I would both agree that August, September, and October were really strong months for Dragon Gate. And now Yamato's back. And now Shun's back. And now we're getting Takuma Fujiwara in for a week. And that was, you know, at at the time we were talking about this, we didn't know that Kakuta was going to be as strong as he was. We didn't know that Natural Vibes versus Zebrats was going to be as strong as it was. We didn't know that Ben K was going to have a charisma transplant and completely reform his career. All of this positive stuff has happened over the last three months, and you and I, when we entered August, were gritting our teeth and really, really concerned that we were going to hit like a three to six month low period in, in Dragon Gate from a creative and from an output standpoint. And it's been the exact opposite. And Gate of Destiny feels like a culmination of all of that. And to get just a little sneak preview of what's to come with this vocal crowd show on October 27th was pretty exciting. Yeah. And it's something that I think that we won't see any of the, the timidness on Sunday. You know, it's just, I, I think that both times it was sprung on them. And now this, like, as soon as the show, like, tickets went on sale, they said, yeah, there's going to be cheering here. So I, I think that those, the the crowds will have warmed up when it's happened before at Dragon Gate. But I think for this night, it's going to be such a kind of big thing. Okay, so there was one more YouTube match that you had me specifically watch. And this was from Matsuyama on the 29th. It was a three-way tag with Hion Diamante, Zebra, it's a... Dragon Kid and Kaito Nagano, and then UT and Jackie Funky Kamei have natural vibes. And I have to say, I did not anticipate like being this like blown away by Kaito Nagano in this match. Yeah, let me quickly note on the 27th, we, we spent some time talking about the main event there. I thought the opening match on that show, Ben K, Coach Minora, and Minorita versus Jason Lee, KZ, and UT was the match of the night, uh, at least of what we saw. I went three and three quarters on that opener, and it goes back to what we have been talking about, where he, he's not quite there yet, but that was a six-man tag, and everybody that's ever listened to an episode of this show knows my thoughts on Jason Lee knows uh, I love UT, I love KZ, Coach Minora is fantastic. That was a Minorita match. That was him outworking everybody, and I thought he was incredibly compelling in this 10-minute opener. 
not quite leading again. He's not there yet, but being on the same level in ring wise as a Uchi and really competing well with Jason Lee and Casey. So I just want to mention that there. Did that match do anything for you other than just kind of existing? I was three and a quarter on it. So like I liked it. It was something that like the crowd, like I was waiting for the crowd to get into to get more and more active. But as we said, the crowd got really got warmed up by the main event there. But I thought it was like the right way to kick off this. And uh Minorita led or like Minorita focus, it's gonna be interesting because of how he works as a smaller wrestler that like him and UT is gonna be a very interesting proposition in about six months. Yeah, that's uh Again, I, I'm I'm suddenly very excited for the the future of Minorita from an in-ring perspective, and that's not something that I felt even over the summer when he was being pushed really heavily and was in these really big matches. It's something something about Ben K being interjected into that unit has just helped everybody out, and and Minorita might have benefited the most, even though Minora is back to a point where he doesn't have at least with me, doesn't have that go away. He, Ben K has never felt fresher, but it's Minorita who is just very intriguing to me. I'm, I'm really enjoying watching him right now. Uh, but then you had that match on the 29th that I directed you to, the Diamante and Hyo versus Jackie Funky Command UT versus Dragon Kid and Kaito Nagano match. And Mike, I believe before I cut you off that you were saying something about Nagano here. Yeah, this is, I, I don't want to call it a full-on breakout performance from Kaito Nagano this like it's it's something that like I, we've seen that kind of stuff this year. But this was like such a huge step for him, and it was really like like him and Diamante. Like of course that's going to be an awesome pairing, but they really, really were something special in the closing stretches in this match. I was not, and shame on me because I am the one that normally waves this flag. I wasn't expecting Nagano to be this good, this fast, and have this much impact. I mean, this was a a semi main event. Now, he was the sixth most important person of the six people in this match, but it it was a semi-main event with a guy who debuted in August. And I just, because of his size, and although I loved his debut match against Kai, but because of his size and because of the fact that I, I didn't look at him as this incredible charismatic being upon his debut, I didn't think two months later he would be in these positions. I, I didn't see this happening. I didn't see him becoming an innovative flyer doing these crazy twisting head scissors that I've never seen before, but they have something with him. And I'm really curious to see on those December cork and hall shows, if they do anything special to spotlight him before the calendar flips over. Yeah. It's something that watching him, the, the big thing that I think really kind of like stood out to me is his crispness. Like he does not have very many rookie missteps for doing what he's doing. And it, it, it's something that... No, I'm going to save that question for another time. I, I, I want to wait a little bit before asking you this question. I have a question I really badly want to ask you about oh Kaito Nagano. Oh my goodness, Nagano. Mike Spears with a tease. I, I, don't know, I don't know what that question could be either. So no, okay, all right, yeah, all right. Yeah. Circle back to it, put a pin in it. There might it, be it, a there there. It, you know when, when we'll circle back to this case? Y- What's that? You're in award stuff. Ooh, I've and, got and I've not got some, in the I've, way you're thinking. Okay, all right. I've I've got I've got some thoughts on uh on rookie of the year once again on this show. We'll discuss that when we get to it. Yeah. So I just thought it was like a really cool thing, and you know they did a lot of classic six uh, like multi team six man stuff that you would have seen in Universal Lucha Libre. Like I, I I did dig how they did the uh, the head scissor crab spot into like Kyo like directing traffic for Diamante. I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, there's, you know, it's the value of Diamante that we just continue to see grow and grow where I just, I, you know, in the same way that they paired off Estrella with Diamante for most of last year and Estrella grew as a wrestler because of it, I want six months of every house show Nagano is going to be in a six man tag and Diamante is going to be on the other side because I think that would revolutionize the way Nagano wrestles and he's already very competent. He's already good. But him being in the ring with Diamante is only going to make him better. And it is amazing the amount of guys that Diamante has made better since August of 2020 when they resumed shows from COVID. Yeah, it's something that I know how devoted he is to the company and sees it as like his home. But he is someone that like a lot of companies and a lot of scenes need someone like Diamante sometimes. I fear. I mean, I've said this on the show before. I fear 
wrestling companies watching Dragon Gate because they're going to see Diamante and go, oh, we need that immediately. I mean, if I was <laughs> if I was starting a promotion right now, outside of you know, you know, oh, your John Boxley or your Brian Danielson or your Kenny Omega, you know, outside of your one A stars, Diamante is on the short list of guys that I want. I mean, I don't know if I could name ten wrestlers that I'd, I'd prefer to have on my roster before getting to Diamante. Yeah, you, you know what what like this is. I, I feel like like if you're doing something like this, he is what people are saying for a long time Claudio Castagnoli was and still kind of is, you know? Yeah, it tur- like, turns out Claudio can actually still be Claudio. He just wasted right. a decade of his life in a company that didn't see value in him. But no, I mean, he's he's, he's literally – he's Mexican Claudio. And the thing that I always hold on to with Diamante is uh, apparently he's incredibly handsome underneath the mask and – I, I don't want him to lose that edge, especially because I'm so into he and Shun teaming and being this mass tag team. But at some point, he's going to lose the mask, and it, it, it's probably going to benefit his career. Yeah, and and that's going to be the, like the real fun part, seeing where that goes when that happens. I really want Yuki Oshioka versus Diamante for the Dreamgate belt. I don't think it's going to happen, but I really, really want that. Hey, you've been speaking that into existence, and we'll see if eventually fates will listen to your call uh dragon gate in usa we're gonna go a little quickly on this uh there were two big shows really this weekend defy and prestige they're doing pacific northwest uh 29th and the 30th uh case were you able to find the defy match i i did not watch the defy show unfortunately I, i'm looking forward to watching that match because i think the combination is cool i i thought for all of the the booking of the dragon gate in usa guys the Defy match on paper is one of the cooler things that have been laid out. Yeah, and it was something that this was not the original match. They changed it around. Originally, it was Ultimo and La Estrella versus Nick Wayne and Gringo Loco, and they changed it around for for the, for the best, but also probably it, it was probably directed to change that match around. But the the cool thing about this match really was that it let Ultimo do like the big legend hot tag. And... Nick Wayne taking a huge beating. Uh, Estrella, I I think, looked better against Commander, to be honest. But uh, it it was a very, very cool match because it was all built up around, like, how long can, like, Nick Wayne, like, do this? It was done under Lucha rules. Uh, La Estrella actually got a bunch of near falls on Ultimo. Like, actually, like, kicked out of one uh, or got out of one Law Mod's draw kiss. That was that that was that that was a surprise. That, that is that is a surprise. Um, obviously, Ultimo is the one that designed that La Estrella character. I believe we've said that on the show before, um, but some people might not be aware of that. So there's a certain level of care that Ultimo is going to take with Estrella and sending him to Mexico and sending him around the world. Even if, you know, it, Yamato had these high-profile bookings, uh, Fujiwara is being taken care of in Mexico and SB Kento is a maybe a little bit in between where a guy like Fujiwara is and then Estrella, who they just sent to North America and said, go, go be there for a while. I mean, Estrella has been completely on his own. He has landed in, you know, some problematic situations uh, since living in Florida. But and Paul Mac think- promotions. Yeah, it's. I feel like Law Australia's view of America is very different from mine, which is very interesting to think about. <laughs> um, did you think Australia looked really thin? Oh no, he's gotten into really good shape. I like. I don't know if it's good shape or not. Like I watched him on the Prestige show, and I just kept on thinking about how weird his body looked. Now he used to be really pudgy. You know, the, the first year of his career, he was sort of a thick flying boy, but. There was something about his his body watching him in that commander match that I didn't I didn't like the way it was looking, which I realize is a mean thing to say. I don't mean it like that. I just it seems like he's in the process. His body is not a finished product. He's working towards something and he's not there yet. I I, I think that is fair to say. Uh, one last the fi note just before we move on to that prestige show. Uh, for, for some reason, they kept on referring to Ultimo as the founder of Dragon Gate Pro Wrestling, which is factually inaccurate. Just may, may, maybe that maybe Ultimo said like, "Oh, Toriyaman, you know, like this become Dragon Gate," and that is correct. But he was that that was not an Ultimo led thing, and that was, and, and that has been very publicly not that for like eighteen years. So 
I am that not. I am not saying me. you're wrong. I'm sure if Dave Prezak would have said that, I would have lost my mind. But that really got under your skin. I. It, it, I'm sorry. Like I, I'll say this. For the most part, I do not have like. I, I know, like, whenever, like, the GCW stuff happened, especially, like, the SBS for Shun Skywalker, that really just, like, infuriates. But that was just something that I don't know if that was, like, a mistranslation or if that was someone trying to... No, or, no, no, or no, no, getting... no, no, that was, that was MLJ being incompetent. Let's not give them the benefit of the doubt. Oh, oh no, I was talking about the whole uh, Ultimo finding. Oh, found it. Okay, all right, I follow, I yeah. follow. but... But but that's neither here nor there. Just kind of want to point it out here. But the, this the Five Roseland Four show. It's on IWTV. Uh, so for those who want to check it out there, Inter- did Yamato? Did, hold on. Did Yamato not wrestle on that show? On that Defy show, I don't think he was booked. The only match that I saw with the Dragon that was booked with Dragon Gate guys was that tag, I believe. All right, I'll take your word for it. But this uh, prestige show from uh, Roseland Ballroom in Portland, I. I, I was really, like, really kind of happy and both blown away of the three kind of matches we got out of the, the show from the Dragon Gate guys. The best Dragon Gate in USA match I've seen this year is still Yamato versus Fred Yehai, but SP Kento versus Kevin Blackwood certainly put put in a shot of, like, hey, this is this is a notebook match. I mean, I went four stars on SPK versus Blackwood, and it was really nice to see SP Kento so, you know, a point that I've hammered home is it's character work, it's character work. You know, this guy's getting over not because of his great matches, but because of his character work. And while there was still that classic SBK stuff intertwined into this match, this was just a, a hot little U.S. indie work rate match, and, and SB Kento proved that he can deliver one of those. Yeah, if he's not getting taken to Reseda like Akira Tozawa, he can make the Roseland Ballroom his Legion Hall. I'm totally okay with that. Uh, you know, we'll we'll see what happens there. I, I I know at one point there was an effort to get him into the uh, Globe Theater, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. But no, here versus Blackwood. I mean, this was this was hard hitting. This was aggressive. This was a, a, a nice a nice way of seeing SP Kento get beat up and then seeing him be able to dish it right back. I mean, I think Blackwood is super talented. Not somebody that I I really ever see having a future in Japan for Dragon Gate, but somebody that I think when they they come over here. That's a guy on their level. That's a guy that Drangate should have their wrestlers wrestle against. And Blackwood versus SB Kento, I just thought was terrific. And they're running this back in two weeks in the King of Indies. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. That, that's great. And, and, and West Coast <laughs> Pro will take that match seriously. They'll take that match as a big deal and present it as such. So that's exciting. I think this one... And I, I know for Freddie A. High, you were in the building and that might... You, you know, that's a live... Uh, view here i think i like this match a little bit more than yamato versus freddy a high honestly i uh, thought that this this was the like the match i've been wanting sb kento to have the opportunity to have like this entire excursion so like i was salivating for this kind of match other than him showing up in triple a and it just being triple a and sb kento from all accounts being really excited to work there and then having a a, a relatively good match uh in his debut this was far and away the best thing that SBK has been involved with since leaving Japan. Yeah, so I definitely would seek this out. Uh, you mentioned Commander versus La Stray here, and uh, a Commander won this match. Uh, uh, Kevin Blackwood beat uh, SB Kento. Uh, but it, it, it's something that like I like. The, they did this match immediately after the SB Kento versus uh, Kevin Blackwood one. So you had two completely different uh, styles happening here, and you, you know, this was uh, like something that I think for like Estrella to like have this kind of match and to and, and for it to mostly succeed, I would say like that's a big step for him, especially against someone who, at, at least amongst like the Lucha side of the Indies, is as close to a breakout star as possible right now. Oh God, yeah. Um, did did you watch the uh, the October Gleet Cork and Hall show yet? That was the last thing I had. Okay, okay. So that's all, I did not get to that one. The Bandito and Commander debut is not great, but I thought both of those guys looked really good individually. There's one spot, you'll see there's a dive spot that doesn't totally go Commander's way, and it's a bummer because if he would have nailed that, it would have been the biggest gif in wrestling for a week, but he, he slips up a little bit. You'll see it when you watch it. But yeah, I, I, you know, this was a fun match. I I was nervous when I saw this got announced. It just seemed like it would be a way for Estrella to get exposed really easily. 
but he hung with commander here i mean he it, it i haven't seen a match where Australia had to be the base to this degree before and he did an okay job there yeah and the highlight was his sliding german that he's now using in all of his matches yeah, that's uh, th- I, I found this to be better than I thought it was going to be. I was pretty worried, um, like I said, when I saw this match announced on paper, because I, I could just see that being a total uh, chemistry clash because Estrella has, up to this point in his career, needed a bigger guy to bounce off of, and Commander's not that. Commander's not much bigger than Estrella is. But this was sort of a wacky, you know, almost like a Ricochet versus AR Fox type match where it was big move, big move, big move, and then the finish, and it was pretty satisfying, all things considered. Yeah, I'd say that. And then the last one was Yamato challenging for the prestige title against Alex Shelley. And, you know, this was just a f- I, I, this was just like, oh, yeah, Shelley's going to ru- exactly be the kind of guy that Yamato wants to wrestle with. And if you've seen everything that both of them have said on Twitter ever since then, like they both really wanted this match and they both highly valued like wrestling against each other. And y- it, you could tell during this uh, title match, like this was more of a the Dreamgate match that you kind of would expect from your motto happening here, I thought. And I thought this was really rad. Did you see Alex Shelley hitting Naoki Tanizaki up on Instagram recently? I do not follow Alex Shelley on Instagram. I know that's a surprise. Uh, I, well, I, I, I don't either, but I or, or, Shelley or like... Case, case, hold on. Did you expect me to actually be following Naoki Tanizaki on Instagram? Like, because yes. that's... No, yes, that does po- seem like something you would do. <laughs> m- m- much higher possibility, and at one time, yes, you would be correct. Uh, Tanizaki posted something from, like, a secret base show on his Instagram, but Alex Shelley responded asking where to watch it, and I only know this because later Tanizaki tweeted... And was like, oh shit! I didn't realize Alex Shelley was asking me where to watch this secret base show. Um, so Alex Shelley is still, by all means, a ginormous wrestling nerd, and I mean that in the best way possible. I'm a little lower on Shelley's current in ring than other people are, but you're exactly right. It, you know, certainly not the Zachary Wentz match, not even the Yay High match. Obviously, none of the GCW f- stuff that Yamato did. None of it felt this big, and this felt like a a match that for a big u.s indie title which is exactly what it was and that's a compliment you know it, it felt worthy of being a main event in a pretty prestigious company so so props to them i would go about three and a half stars on this yeah i was notebook on it but i totally get if you're more down on shelly right now with that it, this like from like the start where i had their name written down but i can't read my handwriting but the prestige is uh ring announcer doing J- yamato's introduction in like picture f- in, in like fluent japanese like could not t- could not tell and then yamato was like genuinely like touched and taken aback i thought like from that on i was like okay we are kind of we're probably in for something here and I, and that's really what we kind of saw uh case do you think we're going to be getting that uh, body scissors spot on sunday i hope so uh, th- you're th- that's that certainly seemed like something that yamato was kind of workshopping on this run yeah, that that's that, that was my takeaway since he did it again here. Uh yeah, and and then uh Brian Zane was identifying like what Dragon Gate actually was during this was something I appreciate. It's like, yeah, there is the the uh, like the lucha like pack backbone to it, but there's also the fact that this is an incredibly hard hitting promotion and Yamato embodies that one side of the coin. And I thought that that was a really astute thing that we have not had happen on this set of uh, Dragon Gate and USA shows. The prestige commentators were certainly something. I, I ended up watching a good chunk of this show yesterday, which I don't, unless I'm in the building for an AAW show, I, I'm not really in a position where I'm watching US indie shows from start to finish at this point. I'm just parachuting in and watching what I like. But I watched basically all of this prestige show. Uh, I did fast forward the Danger Aaron match once I realized that it was an endless slog of bullshit. Uh, but I unfortunately watched about 10 minutes of it. But the prestige commentators were hit and miss, but the one thing that I will say, the compliment that I will give them, is that for the Dragon Gate matches, they igno- they they made it seem like the Dragon Gate guys were a big deal, and that's really all I ask, and that's what Veda Scott did. That is what Tyler Voles did in AAW. That is what I'm looking for, is just acknowledge that these are international stars coming to your promotion, and uh, I thought they did a good job of that. Yeah, no, absolutely, for sure. Okay, should we get into Gate Destiny finally? Uh, I would love that. 
So Gate of Destiny comes to us on November 6th from Edeon Arena Osaka. It will be on DragonGate.live. Dragon Gate Network with English commentary. Cheering is allowed. It is a local time 5.30 start, uh, 3.30 for the East Coast, 12.30 for the Pacific, 8.30 Greenwich Mean Time. Case, do you know what holiday that this is based around? I know it's daylight saving time here, but in Japan, I do not know. It is culture day. It is, as uh, Dragon Gate, for people who might not know, Dragon Gate pretty much tie, tie, pegs their major shows around holidays. Uh, a lot of them are like the Japanese national holidays. Like That's why Dead or Alive during Golden Week it is falling on a holiday because everyone's off work. This time, it is around culture day, and this is also why... Uh, and the night previous, in the very same re- building, New Japan is running the Battle Autumn show. And they've always done this for like the last decade. Yeah, luckily this falls on a weekend. We've had a really bad streak of Dragon Gate pay-per-views being on like a Thursday morning uh, our time. And that's that's super annoying. So they're, they're in the big building in Osaka. This is Saturday night into Sunday morning. Like I said, I'll be watching live. I'm, I'm really excited for this show. Off the bat. They did 1685 in this building last year with Yamada versus BB Hulk as the headlining match. Do you see them going over, under, or about the same this year? I think it's over. I think that uh, everything of Yuki Yoshioka as champ has been not booming, but trending upwards in a healthy with, with a healthy slope. I would say uh, it, it's been a, it's been something that's not like crawling for fans, but you know it's it's a healthy like. Each show is having more and more, and you have your motto in the main event. So, yeah, I think it does higher than that. I mean, would you say that Yuki Yoshioka right now is a bigger draw than BB Hulk was last year? 100%, yes. So, yeah, I, I, I would expect it to be bigger. Do you, think they, I, hit, do you think they hit 2,000? I, if, I, now I'm going to have to go look up Edeon Arena Saka numbers to, to think about, like, what 50% of Edeon Arena Saka is. Uh, but, so... Well, that's that. You know what? I don't know what the fifty percent capacity is. I'll I'll say this while you're looking that up. Uh, Noah claims they claim that they did basically three thousand for the N one victory final in September, which was Kiyomiya versus Hideki Suzuki in the final, and a great Muda and great Okan, uh, <laughs> great Muda, great Okan, and Nozawa six man tag in the semi main event. They did. Uh, 2988 i don't fully believe that number but we'll go with it and do you think that a a yamato versus yuki yoshioka card can draw over 2000 fans assuming that that fits in with the 50 percent capacity that is restricted on this show so that would be doing about 25 percent better than last time um that's the actual thing like over under 2000 I, I'm just going to take a, a stab in the dark. I'm probably wrong. 1950, so under. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go over. I think they will. They will come close to 2100. Yeah, but like 2000. That's a great over under line, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Pegged it there. Uh, let's start off with the opener. Before we get into that, nine matches on the show. Every title is on the line. The opener, however, is an eight man tag. Natural vibes. KZ UT. Uh, Jason Lee, Jackie, Funky, Kame versus a veteran one. This would be one that you could call Torimon Generation a couple of years ago, or you could call this We Are Team Veteran or Team Veteran Returns. But it is Ultimo Dragon, Don Fuji, Shuji Kondo, and making his return to Dragon Gate and to pro wrestling since announcing his freelance status, Naruki Doi and Osaka. Okay, I got a lot to say about this opening match, and I, I wasn't necessarily expecting that, and then I sat down today. And I looked at the names here, and there's just a few things that I want to go over. One, like you said, it's going to be Doi's first match since September 23rd. His first match since going freelance, and obviously his first time in Drangate as a freelance wrestler. Are you aware of Doi's upcoming DDT dates? I want to talk about those with you briefly. No, but it does seem like that's where he's heavily going towards. Uh, they, they did. I, I did see on the Japanese side, I didn't know if the English side has tweeted this yet, though, Case. They also... Did announce today uh, Doi's remaining Dragon Gate dates for the rest of the year. The English side just tweeted that, so we can get to that okay. in just a second. Uh, Doi is working three upcoming DDT shows, uh, November 12th, November 13th, and November 18th in Osaka, Kyoto, and Cork and Hall, respectively. 
Osaka show. It's going to be Yuji Hino, Makatoshi Oshi, and uh, Shiro Asahi versus Doi Owashi and Kazuki Harada. The Kyoto show is going to be Indo, Doi, and Akita versus a trio of DDT wrestlers, some of whom I'm not super familiar with. And then Cork and Hall is going to be Harashima, Doi, Awashi, and Harata versus another, uh, uh, at this time, uh, quartet of DDT wrestlers that I'm not super familiar with. It, they're, they're booking Doi in Osaka, Kyoto, and Cork and Hall. That cannot be a coincidence, can it, Mike? No, because as I'm looking at the appearance schedule for Dragon Gate, Whole lot of Osaka, Kyoto's, and Tokyo's. One Kobe, one Fukuoka. Yes, they are. They are going after the Drangate towns. They are bringing the Rookie Doi with them. Obviously, DDT is a promotion that is, I mean, currently struggling to draw in Tokyo, but has always struggled to draw outside of Tokyo. And I think they're looking at Doi as, hey, can we get an extra 100, 150 fans in the building for a Naruki Doi appearance, especially this first time around? Let's give that a shot. So I don't know, you know, by, by this time, two weeks from now, we could be talking about Doi as a KOD six-man tag team champion uh, with Awashi and Harata. That would not totally surprise me. Uh, we saw them do a similar thing with Strong Hearts when they came into DDT, where they immediately belted them up, popped some houses, and then got rid of them. I think Doi will be around a little bit longer, albeit a little less frequently than the Strong Hearts were, but it would not surprise me if they belted them up with those six-man tag team titles in his first appearance. No, and having him in Disaster Box with Harada makes a lot of sense, too. Harada's a former dojo guy. So that that, that all, like, lines up, you know, that, that makes total sense there, and... Looking at this, actually, Doi's working more dates in Dragon Gate than I kind of expected. I thought it would just kind of be Tokyo, and that was it. But he, of course, is working Sunday for Gate Destiny. He's working the Tokyo Corkin on the ninth. He is not work. He is not working the split show with with uh, Noah. But he will be back for both Corkins in December on the sixth and sixteenth. So there's a chance for Doi darts. We'll see about that on the tenth in Kyoto, the farewell show in Kyoto for the year, and then he will be at Final Gate on Christmas Day uh, in Fukuoka, not at Gate of Origin in Sendai the week before that, and then the traditional fan appreciation hometown show ending out the year two days after uh, the final gate will be in Kobe on the 27th. That's the last show of the year for Dragon Gate, and that will be the last show for Nuruki Doi and Dragon Gate for 2022. That's about what I expected from him. Again, I can't emphasize strongly enough, and I especially emphasize this uh, given how do i want to phrase this given some possible rumblings of some things that could be published this week i want to emphasize strongly right now that the doi going freelance appears to be amicable by all sides this is far different from say the kaito ishida split or the kaisuke akuda split this is doi uh, almost it's it's a little similar to where Shingo was at when he started working All Japan and Big Japan before the New Japan bounce, where he he really earned a sort of freelance status. And not that Doi's outgrown Drangi, but as his career winds down and he could retire next year or the year after, it would not surprise either of us. He's going to spread his wings a little bit more. And look, right now he's working DDT with his really good friend Toro Washi. That is the extent of this. Note that Doi is on the fan appreciation show to end the year. There is seemingly no beef between him and Drangate that, that we can conjure up. Yeah, like compare and contrast here for one second. Case, do you know what Keisuke Akuda is doing on Sunday? No, I saw a photo of him and a very pretty woman on his Instagram page a few days ago, but I don't know what he's doing on Sunday. Well, he will be at Dolphins Arena in Nagoya opening up a Ryzen Ry landmark show, probably getting his ass kicked. Okay, yeah, no, that's... <laughs> Sunday's going to be a bad day for Kaisuke Okuda. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I hope he has he has a good sponsor in Nagoya to help him out after that. But this opener, I just... You, you know, this is a... the They like having Natural Vibes open up these shows. You'll do the whole uh, third chapter Natural Vibes dance, and, you know, you have Ultimo, you have Don Fuji. It, it's... This is something that, I mean... We're getting this kind of match out of the way early, even though the match further down the card is even more egregious of that. But there's a lot here. I, I think it's going to be a fun opener. The thing I'm going to say is don't sleep on this match in terms of match quality. I think they're going to get time. I think they're going to go out there and try to kill it. Doi is obviously hurting. He hurt his neck over the summer. He's been in pretty rough shape. But I think he's going to be working hard. Obviously, that vibe side is going to be working really hard because they always do. Let's talk about KZ for a second. 
Should we be concerned that Casey is working an opener here? And I ask that because if you look at the big shows for this year, Champion Gate Night 1, he loses the Triangle Gate belt in the main event. Champion Gate Night 2, meaningless eight-man tag team match. Dead or Alive, he and UT defended the Ryukyu Dragon Pro tag team titles against Dragon Kid and Yamato. He was not a heavy force in King of Gate. He lost in the quarterfinals to Shun Skywalker. He was in an opening six-man tag on the Ultimo show. He was in a Triangle Gate match where he was the first team eliminated at Kobe World. And then he was in that no DQ vibes versus uh, Zebrats match at Dangerous Gate. It, it, KZ has certainly slipped down the totem pole a little bit this year. Should we be concerned that he's not getting a big match on this show? No, I, you know, it's something that like you, you had, these were the four guys left over from natural vibes who were in the twin gate match. KZ is someone that he's in the opener because how they view the opener and dragon gate views the opener very importantly. So I'm not worried about this. I mean, he he had two twin gate or he, he had like two dream gate matches in 2020 like it it it's it sometimes like and then he had any main event of kobe world last year i mean it's all right to cycle down for a year all right i'm with you there i just want to get your thoughts on it real quick before we move on do you want to be spoiled on who chris jericho's opponent was tonight is it loki it is not loki then did they just bring davy in they did not bring Davy in. Okay, the, then, like, at this point, like, are they just, like, actually going to get PCO? It, I will say this. I had a, I, I muted myself from popping when this guy came out. Okay, who is it? Cole Cabana. Ah, uh, yeah. No, go, okay, there we go. There we go. Kind of fun, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It sounds like that uh, they're getting that house in order. Hey, there was a low-key versus Shingo singles match this past weekend, and I haven't heard a peep about it. Was it at Hog? It was at Hog. Yeah, that's why. But Hog's on Fight Plus, and okay, somehow I forgot to unsubscribe from Fight Plus in the deep depths of COVID when I was watching the really bad SWE Fury promotion. So, <laughs> sorry guys, I, I inadvertently gave like 40 bucks to Triller to go have this network. Yeah, uh... I just, I find that odd that that match happened and that nobody is talking about it. But anyways, uh, I'm not worried about KZ. I'm excited for a new rookie doi. I think that opening match is going to be really strong. And then we have match two. It is Ginky Horiguchi and Kaito Nagano versus the M3K pair of Yazushi Kanda and Isha Nahashi. I, I have grown to kind of like this Kanda and Nahashi pair whenever there has to be triangle gate things around. And it'll be fun to see Nagano now against Ishin at this point. I'm going to set another over-under here. Over-under is 4.5 for combined flat-back bumps between Genki Horiguchi and Yasushi Kanda. Over because uh, Ishin's going to hit the choke slam on, on probably Genki to win. You don't think Ishin pins Nagano? No. Uh, I Ishin's past, you know, only being able to pin rookies, you know? Interesting. All right. I disagree with that. I think he'll pin Nagano here. I think this match will be be fun, and I expect Kanda and Horiguchi to do nothing. I really expect this to be a battle of the young guys. Yeah. And, you know, for like this position on the show, that's really kind of what I want. Match three, here are your two sides for the touch football game this evening. On one side, you have Takashi Yoshida, Punch Tomonaka, and Yosuke San Maria, along with Hoho Loon. The other side, Kota Maui, Chikawa, Sachi, Hoko Boy, Problem Dragon, and Gurkin Mask. Uh, hopefully, between entrances and exits, this takes under 10 minutes. Should be fun. This is going to be your touch football match of the night, but this has no reason to, to be anything substantial. Yeah, don't linger. Guys, don't linger. Uh, match four is the last, uh, last undercard match, I think it's fair to say. This is the... Gold class tag team of Kota Minora with Minorita, along with Ben K versus BB Hulk and Diamante of Z Brats. Look, when uh when we were on the road to this show, I really thought it was gonna be Yoshioka versus Ben K headlining Gate of Destiny. That obviously did not turn out to be the case, but I can't shake the idea that Ben K is challenging for the Dreamgate belt at some point this year. And as odd as it is to say, both BB Hulk and Diamante are still very protected and a spear to one of those guys resulting in a Ben K pinfall could be that last boost that he needs before he challenges 
either Yoshioka or Yamato for the Dream Gate belt, and that could be a, a very worthy Final Gate main event. So I see Gold Class winning here. I see Ben K staying hot, and I think this could be the thing that leads him to challenging for the Triangle Gate belt. See, I see that as likely, but I think this match is laid up to set up that three-way uh, trios match later on this week. Like, because you have natural vibes, you have gold class, the only thing you're missing out as of is natural vibes, you know? So you, you have Z-Brats and gold class. I think I said natural vibes and, Z, and gold class. But I, I, I do think it's something that's notable. Like, these are four very protected people in this match. Like, Minora probably is... is less protected at this very moment than Ben K because Ben K like it's very clear that everyone knows what, it, what they have at this moment with him. So I, yeah, like no matter what, like if Ben K does like the spear with Minorita on one of them, like that's going to be something to kind of uh, file in your notebook and, and refer back to in four weeks. Is there a chance they do like a weird 20 minute time limit draw here or some sort of non finish? Yeah. Uh, I could see that to really juice that cork in main event. Doesn't it doesn't it just seem like this specific pairing of guys? I mean, look, BB Hulk could eat a spear and it's not going to the the earth is going to keep spinning. We'll all be fine. But doesn't it just seem like a weird combination of guys that you don't really see take a lot of falls? Yeah, like the one person in this match who you're most likely to see take a fall is Benke. Like, over the last two years, it's Ben K taking the fall here, but Ben K now is the most charismatic man on Earth. I wonder, because I liked I liked the way they formatted that Vibes versus Zebrats. Uh, it was a six-man that turned into a DQ that turned into an eight-man no-DQ match at Dangerous Gate. And I'm just trying to think if there's a way that Zebrats can add a third here and then get Minorita involved into like a restart. I don't think that's going to be the case just because I can't logistically make it work out. But don't I'll say this. Don't be surprised if there's a non-finish for this match. I don't think that's the yeah. direction they're going to they're gonna go. I really think it's going to be Ben getting a strong pinfall win. But don't be surprised if there's a weird fuck finish here. Yeah, no, this is definitely the match to keep your eyebrow up about then we get into the the uh, the upper card first with our sp oh sorry oh no go ahead i was gonna say uh first we're getting good get into our special singles match this is ata and a singles match against the returning for the next four days takuma fujiwara look this is this is why i'm waking up early i mean this is this is the match that I am interested in. I, I have a million thoughts here. I I want you to go first. Big picture, Ata versus Fujiwara on paper. What are you expecting here? Oh, this is going to be a big spotlight match. Like, I think it's kind of, it, it's something that they're not hiding him like they hid, like, Tozawa when Tozawa came back. Or even when Ada was back, like, he was still kind of a little bit, it wasn't necessarily, like, treated as, like, this, especially considering how Fujiwara was viewed by the crowds before he left. So this is something that this is a statement match here. And for someone like Eita, who's like, at, at least with like Naruki Doi and everything, like we know exactly when to expect him to show up here. We don't really have that with Eita at this point in time. And Eita after Dangerous Gate going into a match like this, I think it's something that I I really hope it's going to be like, I, I, I hope that this is a match where like Ata basically runs back the Dangerous Gate match, but 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 is even more vicious and violent. Like let's get like the crowd going. Like okay, when Takuma Fujiwara is coming back for good, he's going to take off Ata's head. That's really what I want to see here. Uh, this might sound dramatic, but if Ata doesn't work at a hundred percent in this match, if we get some weird bullshit Ata performance. I will take it as a level of disrespect to this company. I mean, I will be appalled f on behalf of Dragon Gate if this is an Ata at the level that we know he can be at. Ata should put a, as much care into this match as Doi put into Ata winning the Dream Gate belt in August of 2020. Because, well, I don't think it's fair to say that this match is that big. Anybody looking at this as just 
you know, a for lack of a better term, a Gabe Sapolsky special singles match or a special challenge match or a grudge match or an international attraction, whatever buzzword Gabe used, this match is bigger than all of that. This is the sort of match that people are going to need to bookmark and remember two or three years, five years. Hell, with the way Fujiwara progresses, maybe it's only six months down the road. This is a match that is going to matter. I expect this to be the match the night. I expect Fujiwara to be incredibly over in front of this crowd. And I expect Ata to work his ass off. And if he doesn't, I am going to be gravely disappointed. And I'm going to be very annoying towards Ata fans next week if that's the case. Case is doing a preemptive Dunzo manifesto on Ata. This is so. It just look, look. This is this is like Ata core. This is an Ata fetish match. This is yeah. a Japanese wrestler who is in, who is returning from Mexico, who is going to go back to Mexico. This is Ata's Ata's getting his wish here. This should be everything that he wants out of wrestling. He should be able to perform it in this match. I am really worried that we're gonna get Peros Ata. Instead of Perito Ata, if that makes sense. Yeah, because I just like look at this thing and I'm like, oh, this is the match that's like, all right. I really want this to be Ata just like destroy, uh, like ripping at him, like like being every bit of Paraguayo Jr. that he wants to be, just destroy like, like Fujiwara. Because I know Fujiwara could take it. I know Fujiwara is such a great wrestler that it's going to work. You know, like I so bad and i feel bad for wishing for this but i think this is the thing with the, with a match like this and with against ata this is something that like you use this as a future payoff down the line like i well like if there's a chance for accidental blood in this match they should go for it really oh 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 my god i mean if i had the pencil you know we're we're, we're sticking the blade and and fujiwara's wrist tape and he's cutting i mean absolutely no you're you're, you're right this is uh, th- there this is one of those matches where the end result is that you hope there's a defining image. There's something that when Fujiwara goes back to Mexico and goes away for another six months or so, when he comes back, you, you hope that you have a mental image of he and Ata bloodied in the ring with one another, or he and Ata in a submission war. There has to be something in this match that lets you latch on to Fujiwara for another six months or however long he's in Mexico. And I, I don't, you know, SP Kento in Australia, I expect back in Japan early 2023. Fujiwara, I have no idea what the plan is with him. But I know when he comes back, he is going to be really, really important. And he is somebody that is going to be pushed aggressively and quickly. And this match sets the tone for the second stage in his career. Yeah, and it's and it is the match that I... 3 30 start we're losing in that oh no the hour would have already been lost at that point i'm just thinking like what time do i actually need to like wake up and go to sleep to wake up, watch this match live i i am i for lack of a better term jazzed for this match i mean i really i think it's going to be something special and you have to remember you know ata was in a similar situation a decade ago he went off to mexico in the summer of 2012 returned for dangerous gate and a brave gate match against dragon kid and then went back to Mexico, and when he returned again, he was second in command of the Millennials. And that is the sort of aggressive push that I expect Fujiwara to get when he returns uh, back to Japan in 2023. So uh, the, the parallels between Eita and Fujiwara here are not lost on me. I- I'm curious. I think you you and I are both under the assumption that Eita is going to be working on top in this match, that Eita is going to be working as the heel Fujiwara lately has been working as a heel in Mexico. Is there any possibility that it's a babyface Ata and heel Fujiwara here? Unless this is Ata's last night in the company, I don't think so. Oh boy, I I, I don't think it is, but I yeah, guess I yeah. guess we'll find out. But 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 you get my point. What I'm saying with that, like, yes. it's for lack of better terms, like the, the, this is such an exciting match, but it's also such a dangerous match. I could because I could see this like five years down the line like this being like, well, uh, the fourth big uh, exodus happened because uh, Ata took Fujiwara under his shoulder and you could see how this goes case, right? Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. But yeah so, no, that's yeah. Then we've got new DTU tag team champions. It's, <laughs> it's, a, stand up. It's a dark timeline. Yeah, uh, but 
it, I, I'd be fascinated by it, but like really like the, I think that like the, they've, they've been careful about what they've been uploading to the network from Mexico. Haven't they? Yes. We got the Nishikawa debut. We got some Shun and SB Kento stuff that I, I don't think there's been a, well, there was the Fujiwara mask where he's F- Fujiwara match where he's under the mask. And yeah. It's like Shun and Nishikawa versus crazy boy and Fujiwara, which is what I wanted to bring up is that, you know, in Mexico as, as of right now, it appears that Fujiwara Takuma Nishikawa, who's a Dragon Gate trainee who went to Mexico and debuted there. SP Kento and crazy boy are all aligned, which makes them heels in Mexico. But I, I expect Fujiwara to basically wear that outfit, to have the, the colored hair, to have the baseball jersey, but to work as a baby face in this match. Yeah, no, it, it, it that's something that is worth it saying. Yeah, it's crazy boy kind of thing. Like, I know that when they had that, like, random debut there, like, they had, like, a backstage segment of crazy boy, too. So, uh, it, 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 it'll be interesting to see, like, if he's going to have all those kind of care, because it's something that's very clear to me. And I've had it communicate to me like there's some care going on at Fujiwara, Mexico right now. So there could be something like that that could pop up here on Sunday. Like I can't like discount that out of hand. The the, the thing that has been in my head over the past few weeks, you know, I, I, I mentioned that I watched the Chris Hero Ultimo Dragon shoot interview that's available on the High Spots Network a few weeks ago. And they were talking about the New Japan Dojo and how muto really didn't spend a lot of time there you know he was so good so quick that they shipped him away from japan and and it's interesting hearing ultimo talk about how that likely really changed muto's mindset on wrestling in japan specifically and his loyalty to new japan not being what others had because he wasn't you know beaten in the dojo to a point where he was new japan through and through you know muto kind of escaped a lot of that punishment and Ultimo sort of reflected on how that might have inadvertently created the monster that is Keiji Muto. But listening to Ultimo talk about how quickly he left the dojo to go travel the world, it's not a one-to-one comparison with Fujiwara, but it's also not crazy to look at those as slight parallels. And I, I really think that's kind of what we're looking at here is, you know, Fujiwara, when he returns, it's going to be in the immediate title picture and i fully expect him and sp kento to have a relationship similar to yuki yoshioka and shun skywalker where they're going to be attached at the hip uh forever because they did an excursion together yeah no absolutely for sure do you have anything else about the special singles match i have a small note okay it is largely unrelated but as you know mike who am i voting for in rookie of the year this year well, it's Takuma Fujiwara. Voting for Takuma Fujiwara. I respect people that vote for Hook, but it is it is not a Hook award to win, in my opinion. The question that I have, and this I might sound like an idiot in 90 seconds, but I want to know if, if this person is a rookie of if this person is a rookie, and if I need to be concerned about them winning this award. Mike, who the fuck is Grayson Waller? Is that somebody that we know? That was an Australian Indies guy who's in NXT. Okay, I this man only yeah. exists to me through Denise Salcedo's Twitter account because she's always <laughs> she's always going like, "Oh my God, look at what Grayson Waller did this week!" And I'm like, I thought it was the Bravado brother who's there at first. And no, that's then, Andre Chase. Great, awesome, good for him. But I don't, I don't know who that is. Like, every, sorry, I'm coughing now. Every once in a while, Robert will be like, "Gotta get Grayson Waller to the main roster," and I'm like, I don't. Is this an indie guy who got signed in 2020, or is this somebody that I, I don't know who the fuck this guy is? And I'm afraid that you know, in March of 2023, when Dave finishes the year in award voting, then it's going to be Hook, it's going to be Grayson fucking Waller, and then it's going to be Takuma Fujiwara, and I don't know who that guy is. I don't know if he's a rookie or not. I think he is. Uh, Technically, by WWE, he debuted on 2FI Live in June of 2021. So, uh, 
he would just miss the cutoff because the cutoff is August of 2021. Yeah, but uh, Aussie guy, uh, he wrestled under the name of Matty Wahlberg, uh, had some matches against named people in PWA. I bet Dave includes him this year. Yeah, probably. And people are going to vote for him. I don't know. Yeah, I, probably. I, Mike, put a gun to my temple and give me 10 wrestlers to look at. I'm guessing nine of them are Grayson Waller before I land on Grayson Waller. I have no idea who this guy is. I just know that he's going to take votes away from Takuma Fujiwara. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I I was thinking back in my head who was going to be the WWE person. And, you know, if uh, Dave uh, be safe about it, I wouldn't be surprised. Because it can't like it can't be Lash Legend because I think nah. even WWE, I think even WWE fans know that she's bad. I, uh, I don't. Nikita don't Lyons. Know. Oh my god! I mean, <laughs> she wasn't Father Stu. Yeah, I just. But they don't. That's like a good point. They don't really have like a young guy that I'm aware of, other than Grayson Waller. That's that people are excited about. I mean, oh, well, I guess Braun Breaker. But at this point, I mean, Braun's been exposed, which I talked about in February about how he just yeah, the, the, that he was wasn't up to the level that ever, yeah, it's he's oh. not. To me, he's not a serious contender, but I guess most people don't know what's up, so they'll they'll vote for him anyways. Yeah, and I don't know, like I I have not read like that kind of stuff into it. I my eyes glaze over when I get to that part of the observer sometimes. But has he clarified Nick Wayne counts because that is someone that will take votes. Nick Wayne will probably end up being second place if he's in this. this I year. feel like he was eligible last year. Let me see if okay. I can find out. Uh, real quick, what does this website? How late is this website updated? Twenty twenty. Okay, that's not okay. I feel like he was eligible last year, but if he's eligible this year, then yeah, then he might even beat Hook. Uh, I I still think Hook would win over him, but he would definitely be the one that would end up in second. It's not going to be Takuma Fujiwara, and that's going to annoy me. That's just that that's the moral of the story here. I mean, this eight to match doesn't count towards the observer voting period but there's not a what this a to match could be there are zero rookies that are capable of of reaching the possible highs that that match will reach yeah and this is functionally fujiwara's japanese one year anniversary match too first time he'll wrestle in front of a vocal audience in japan which you know that's that's something i want to talk about real quick actually i meant to bring this up when we when we started previewing this card, but we started talking about attendance and set. So listeners, forgive me for a second. We're going to pivot away from gate of destiny, 2022, because I want to go back to champion gate in Osaka, 2020 night two, which was the last vocal crowd that Dragon gate had not including the house show this past week where they tested it out. Mike, can I run down this card for you just so hopefully the listeners can get an idea of just how long it's been and how much has changed since we heard cheers from a Dragon Gate audience. Yeah, go ahead. Opening match, Kento Kabune and Takedo Kame versus Ho-Ho Loon and Michael Sue. Let's take a pause right there. A different universe. Yeah, no, like that's really all. We could be done with the exercise right there. All right, I'm going to go through the rest of them and uh, then you give big picture thoughts here. Eight-man tag team match, Team of Dragon Gate, of Dragon Daya, Jason Lee, Problem Dragon, and OG Shiba versus Gamma, Martin Kirby, Masaki Mochizuki, and Ryo Saito. After that, it was KZ and Strong Machine J versus Don Fuji and Geki Horiguchi, which actually could happen today. And then after that, Kaito Ishida and Takashi Yoshida versus Bin K and Kaisuke Akuda, Big R Shimizu, Eita, and Diamante versus Dragon Kid, Kagatori, and Masato Yoshino, Twin gate match of BB Hulk and Cosmo Sakamoto versus Kai and Yamato. And then your main event and dream gate match, Naruki Doi versus Susumi Yokosuka. Different universe. Madoka Kakuta, prior to that house show, had not been in front of a vocal audience. Obviously, you know, Mochizuki Jr., Ryo Fuda, uh, who's not on the show, uh, but Takuma Fujiwara, these guys have not had shares in Japan. SB Kento. The name, he's not on the show, uh, but SP Kento and Jackie Funky Kame, those names have not been in front of cheering audiences, and they were three months into their career the last time they heard cheers. And then you've got names, you know, Gamma, Martin Kirby, uh, Ryo Saito's not a full-time wrestler anymore, Kaito Ishida, Kaisuke Akuda, Kazuma Sakamoto, 
Masato Yoshino. I mean, it, it has been that long since we've heard cheers from a Dragon Gate audience. So I expect food. I expect Fujiwara to be super over. I will say, I don't know if I said that already or not. I expect Fujiwara to be super over and for Fujiwara versus Ata to be the second most heated match of the night. Absolutely. And speaking of someone who was working ring crew duties of that last cla- uh, noise crowd show, the, n- the first title match on the show is the Open the Twin Gate Championship match. Dragon Daya Madoka Kakuda, Madoka Kakuda, who is working ring crew on that show, will be defending against the Big Boss Shimizu and Strong Machine J. Uh, Daya, for, for all intents and purposes, good to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it seemed like that injury was one that looked worse than it actually was. I think this is going to be a super fun match. I, I think with a lot of these title matches, the result is not in question, but I expect all of the title matches to be very good. And this is one of those matches. Just in case Natural Vibes win, and I think, Mike, we're both on the same page that D-Courage is going to retain here, correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, Daya kicks out of the Machine Killer in this, Ooh. and there'll be like a either a, a huge snap pile driver or they'll have a like a tag team move at this point. I think that's a very safe bet. If Big Boss Shimizu and Strong Machine J win, it will be Shimizu's sixth Twin Gate reign with his fifth different partner. I ask you here as a fun exercise, he's a five-time champion with four different partners. Can you name his four Open the Twin Gate partners? Well, I know one of his partners was a two-time, and that was Eita. So, Eita, uh, also uh, Ben K, Big Ben. So those are the two obvious ones. Yep, and he, and he was the two-time champion with Ben uh, with Ben K. I thought it was with Eita. I thought Big it E was, got two nah, runs. Nah, Bi- uh, Big Ben got two. I, I want them to bring back uh, names like that. Big Ben, Big <laughs> yeah. E. That was fun. That, <laughs> like, I almost bought the Big Ben uh, Maximum shirt case at one point. Oh, uh, we uh, we had a lot of stock in Big Ben and Maximum. That was that, look. That was at a time when Maximum was really the only thing keeping us going, and that tag team was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. Uh, he didn't win it in Monster Express, did he? Uh okay, Masato Yoshino. Oh no, no, no Seahawk, T Hawk, T Hawk. It was yeah, Big, Big T. T. Big T. <laughs> Big T. It was, it was Big T. It was Big Ben. It was Big E. And then he finally had a fourth opponent or a fourth partner, rather. God. Okay, who is it? It was Susumi Yokosuka this time last year. Oh, that's right. That Natural Vibes team was, yeah, coming out of uh, Speed Star Final. Yeah, I really liked that team, and they dropped it in their first events after that weekend. No, no, no. They, uh, they who did? Okay, I got, I got to look now. Now I was not expecting on getting off on this tangent, but <laughs> they, they defended the belt a few different times because they won it at World. They defended it at Speed Star Final, and then that's okay. I, so they they defeated the strong machines of strong machine J and strong machine K at Dangerous Gate at this show last year. They defeated How and Kano, if you remember that match, which I thought was excellent. Yeah, this one was longer than I realized. Yes, they lost the Twin Gate belts at Gate of Origin of last year for a million dollars. Who did they lose the titles to? Oh, oh God. I, How, I I would not have got this at all. All right, so who they lose it to? Uh, Kaito Ishida. Oh, oh oh no, this was uh, was this uh was this SBK and Hio? It was not SBK and Hio. It was a babyface team of Naruki Doi and Takashi Yoshida. Oh yeah, Doi Yoshi reuniting. That's yeah, that's right. Don Yoshi reuniting. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um yeah, so I I don't I, I think it's that they're gonna have D courage retained. They really like having the uh them draped in gold. Uh I just really I mean like my, my question down here, Case, is the machine killer that's kind of become like a finish in natural vibes. I'm wondering if they tease it or if they go for it and have to do a kick out here. I can't put anything past D Courage. I think they are the hot hand right now. I think Dragon Gate recognizes that, and it would not shock me if they kick out of that big move here just to further establish them as top dogs. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Back to uh, the Open the Brave Gate Championship, Hyo defends against Dragon Kid, and something that's basically been simmering since Hyo won this belt. They've been going back and forth on social media basically since uh, Kobe World Weekend, and now after Hyo 
retained against Jason Lee earlier this month at or last month uh, in Kobe Sumbo Hall. DK came out and finally challenged him here for Edeon Arena Osaka. Do you think we're going to get a sleaze fest here? Because that's kind of what I'm expecting. We're going to get a sleaze fest here. I said earlier that I expect Fujiwara to be the Fujiwara and Aita to be the second most heated match of the night. I was incorrect. That'll be number three because I think Hyo versus Dragon Kid. My prevailing thought is that if this was just a clap crowd show, this match probably isn't happening. But they want to put their best foot forward, get over 2K in the building, and Hyo versus Dragon Kid is a way to do that. This match is going to be really hot because you have to remember, like we were just talking about, you know, Hyo turned heel, left Mochizuki Dojo in October of 2019. The big brain point scoring microphone fiend that is Hyo really didn't take shape until October of 2020. This is another act that hasn't had a lively crowd in front of it. By the way, Shibata just showed up on AEW uh, and is confronting Pac, apparently. So bookmark that. But Hyo is an act that uh, has not had the proper treatment yet, and I think this crowd is going to be crazy into this match. Yeah, and it's something that I wonder... If it's been enough distance that they might try to do a Brave Gate versus Mask thing down the line and get DK a run with it, because it's been a while for DK. And he, he has not had a Brave Gate match since March 21st, 2019, when he lost the belt to Susumo. Yeah. And it's something that I think with like the weirdness of high end, they kind of, the, the, this makes sense getting him that belt, uh, that belt at a later date i just don't think it's here i think there's my i think there's there's a little bit of runway with Hio and dragon kid i mean they've been working towards this match since august so i i don't think this is a one and done i'll say this i am grumpy at the thought of dragon kid winning because i am just so into Hio as this champion and youth 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 even though it's dragon kid uh i just he he needs to lose. I, I don't want a singles victory of him over Hio anytime soon. Yeah, no, I, I get your point there. I just think that eventually there has to be some time that uh, the chicken he- shit heel eats chicken shit. And I can just really see that down the line, like not here. I think Hio retains here, but I could see them revisiting this. That's that's probably fair. And getting into our semi-main event of the night, it is M3K, Masaki Mochizuki, Susumu Mochizuki, and Mochizuki Jr. defending the Open the Triangle Gate Championship against the Z-Brats pairing of Kai, finally the real Shun Skywalker, and Mask Z, and I guess first and foremost case, who do you think is going to be Mask Z on Sunday? I've said it before, I'll say it again. It is Ishini Hashi. You can lock that in. I am 100% sure it's Ishini Hashi. This is, if I actually had an operating soundboard, this is when I would have the padlock sound being hammered like five times in a row. It'd be a real morning zoo of us. I, awesome. I, I know the world well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I have, I'm looking right now at a 16 key controller that I can do that with. I just, at uh, the time, and I don't think that fits the vibe we put down here. Uh, well, this this show should be more of a morning zoo type show. I think. <laughs> All right, okay, I'll go do this voice, even though I can already, even though we're we're approaching hour thir- hour and a half here. All right, twenty twenty three. We're adding a a soundboard. We're adding bed music. We're adding a the loud. Hus- we're adding a loud Hispanic woman in the background. We are becoming morning zoo. Open the voice gate in twenty twenty three. Yeah, uh, Case, you keep your name. It'll be Case in the Wheeze. <laughs> as, uh, as my friend Sean Sloan calls this podcast, uh, Young Boy in the Tracksuit. Uh, that is another <laughs> option. We have. Okay, that's it. That's our morning drive time pairing. Yes. You can already see that plastered on billboards in the Metroplex and Chicagoland. I don't know if we, we'll be able to get to LA. LA's weird. They still, they still listen to Tom Likas out there. Well, look, you know, I, 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 without, you know, I, I don't want to get too far into it, but as somebody who pays uh, their bills because of a morning radio show, first of all, I work for a company that doesn't have stations in New York or Los Angeles anymore, so I refer to us as Cumulus Market 1 because we're in Chicago. We're their biggest market. And two, what blew me away about the radio industry, there's a lot of things that I did not know that's not really public information. 
the biggest one is how much fucking time you have to spend bill uh brainstorming billboard ideas so mike if you have any good ones for our show let me know so i can repurpose it for my actual job i i, I mean I, th- I felt like we, we'd be standing back to back looking towards the camera with like a laughing smile me and my most resplendent tracksuit if that's the persona that sean sloan thinks i'm portraying <laughs> yeah. all the time you know i wasn't planning on going to all out 2023 i'm a little burnt out on AEW pay-per-views but that doesn't mean that we aren't going to have a professional photo shoot done that weekend for the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, how much must it cost to rent a a billboard in Des Moines, Iowa? I got it. You would you would hope it's under. Could you could you get a billboard for under a thousand dollars in Des Moines? I, I I mean maybe maybe not Des Moines, but maybe Dubuque. Maybe yeah, maybe Duluth, Duluth, Minnesota. All right, that we're going to be number one in the P1s and Duluth Drive Time Radio coming yeah, got up it, in the, tw- in the first 20, books. The, uh, uh, persons 25 to 54, that's what it's all about, Mike. In, in case in case people are confused and think that, that demos are only applied to wrestling, my livelihood depends on persons 25 to 54. It's everything that it, it's the only thing that matters in my life. Case, you, did you get like an optical twitch when I said writing books? Uh, after after some news I received this week, especially yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, get, getting back on rails, uh, Massey Ishan makes a lot of sense. Fuda, of course, like being left off the show, that could be a red herring here. Uh, I don't see this like this company being a place that this would be a prominent freelancer. So, it would I I would expect someone on the roster here, and Ishan just checks all the boxes. So let's go down the possibilities here. The the thing that I like about Ishin Ihashi, and I was on board with this anyways, but especially once we saw the full card, Ishin's in match number two. It's an inconspicuous match. He's going to go over. He's going to get the pinfall there. And then after that, plenty of time to rest up for this Triangle Gate match. And then you obviously, I, I, I think it's Ishin because I think they're going to go back to him and Mochizuki Jr. I think there's a lot of meat left on the bone there. But... There's Ishinihashi. Is Ryu Fuda a possibility? Yeah, because I would like to stress again, whoever was portraying Max Z does not matter. Does not matter. And even though they were supposed to look like Shun Skywalker in the greater scheme of things, that doesn't matter. So uh, Fuda, that would be elevating him. That would be showing a lot of confidence to someone who has been injury prone a lot as of late. It would be elevating him. I do not think he's ready. I do not think he's on that level. And I think him not even like he's not on this show, period. You know, you got Stalker and Sachi Hoko Boy and Punch Tamanaga booked over him. I think that is a pretty bad indictment of Fuda in his current state. I don't see him skipping the line all the way to this match. So I don't think it's Fuda. Could it be? Takuma Nishikawa, who, as we referenced earlier, debuted in Mexico this summer, has not wrestled in Japan yet outside of Dragon Gate Future Exhibitions. So I like Nishikawa in this position more than Fuda. A lot more. And let me tell you why. Well, first and foremost, Nishikawa's body type is he's probably already what we would consider a natural heavyweight 100 kilos. Like, And that is something that when you look at heel units across time, they like having bigger bruisers in there, especially as rookies. So there's that there. There's the whole thing about him doing his debut in Mexico and then really kind of being kept off the radar. Like he does do IWRG in the match that you mentioned before, Case, but Nishikawa in comparison to Fujiwara or Estrella or Shun or SBK when they're in Mexico, it, it, it's been difficult to kind of keep track of the guy. So those are like the little things that... and. My brain, which case you know by now, is just conspiracy riddled, but not in the bad way, in the fun way. That that like that's the argument for Nishikawa in my mind. Yeah, he's been working a lot of DTU lately with Fujiwara. I haven't seen a ton of that make tape yet, but I I hope that it does. Because here's the thing, I am fascinated by Nishikawa because he is a big dude, like you said. He's not like you look at you know the Drangi trainees of the last three or four years, Nishikawa is not the one that you look at and go, hmm, Mexico, Lucha Libre. He he is the biggest dude they've had in quite some time. And from watching him wrestle in Mexico, he is not exactly fluent in Lucha Libre. So 
I think whenever he comes to Japan, he is going to be one of those guys that is pushed pretty aggressively, pretty quickly. The thing with him is that I have seen no evidence of him in Mexico to say that he is ready for this big of a spot. So I do not think it's him. Yeah, like that's the thing is like there's a reason why he was debuted in Mexico and there's a reason why he didn't have his debut in front of crowds in Japan. Like it, 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 he's very much a work in progress. Uh, when you say he's bigger, just like the one good thing about the Soviets in Mexico, we get better sense of his size because Dragon Gate, since it's such an insulated world, you can only sometimes comparative be like, okay, he is bigger than X and that means he is smaller than Y. But seeing him in Mexico, I would say he's the biggest trainee since you, uh, since Benke. Like he's bigger than Shoya Sato. Yes, yes, he is. Um, what about Takuma Fujiwara? He is going to be in Japan for a week. He's going to work this show, the Cork and Hall show, and the Drangate Noah joint show. Currently booked, it is Shun Skywalker and T- and Tadusuke on the Noah show versus Fujiwara and the man formerly known as uh, 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 who who wrestled Kano last year um, or who teamed with Kano. Um, how I just said his, how thank you sorry I forgot his name uh, who I guess lost a loser leaves town match in June and then came right back to Noah under a new name so he's working as uh, uh, Amakusa or something like that uh, it's he and it's he and Fujiwara against Shun and Tadusuke and uh, and Tadusuke right now that could be flipped and they could have Shun and Fujiwara team against those Noah guys if they had to any possibility that it's uh, Takuma Fujiwara uh, enough of a possibility for me not to call you crazy right now. Okay. I mean, he. If we are speculating this, then I do know he has dates in Mexico after this week. Like he is actually going back to Mexico. But that's also the caveat that you know that could be the thing that he's been told to tell people. So, uh, yeah, uh, that would be the elevation. That would be the big step up. That would be the thing getting him into. Uh, big positions then he's kind of already stepping into spk's domain in a way i don't see it happening i don't really want it to happen but it is a young name that i felt worth mentioning what about yoshiki katao who is the drangate future rookie who trained alongside nishikawa and mochizuki jr and uh nagano who has not debuted yet and they have not announced like I remember Katao, but like it, it, it it's something that like it's like yeah no I've seen them in terms of that, but they've never gotten that point. Well, that would be the way to do it to debut someone if you think they're ready for it. I there was nothing about him that I thought was necessarily remarkable from Future, but we've learned pretty we, we've learned in the two years that they've done Future what kind of emphasis to put on that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean that's someone that is. I, I would put on the list. I wouldn't put him high on the list, but I would put him on the list. For all we know, he might not be in the company anymore. It's the weird thing with those future guys where, you know, maybe Nishikawa got sent to Mexico and Katao just faded away. And we don't know that yet. And, and we can try to figure that out. I do not think it's him for as highly as I think of the Drangate talent, uh, talent development system. I just have a hard time believing that, Mochizuki Jr. and another main event level rookie are in the same class. That would be unparalleled levels of training, and that just seems unrealistic to me. Yeah, it, it, it's something that like this person would have to be like this once in a lifetime wrestler for that to, to really, really happen. But I mean, Dragon Gate's also the company that you know elevated SB Kento in that manner and had. Uh, Strong Machine J be on a long winning streak and be the quickest champion in history. So, you know, it, it, it's a very unlikely, but, you know, it's something that I can't say can't happen. Is there anyone that I'm missing? Anybody else that it could be? <sighs> no, could, it no. be could, could it be Nagano? Nah. I agree. Nah. I agree. I, I just, nah. Uh, uh, no one that would call realistic that like I, I don't think you could list Riki Ahashi or Shoya Sato coming back for this. I think that's no, that's, no, zero zero percent on those. Yeah, yeah, those were the ones I would call you crazy for just for suggesting. I don't know. It, it's something that you look at like high end being at its position. I don't think you. It, I mean, Kakator is out, out, so it's not like he can defect there. 
Strong Machine J, I can't. Strong Machine J is in a match right before that. Because there's the thing about Strong Machine J storming off about Mask Z that I feel like still is kind of a little bit important, but weirder things have happened than Strong Machine J wrestling and then later on wrestling in that. But that's just my own just uh, noticing something and maybe reading too much into it. I, he was the name that I almost threw on this list. I, I don't think that's impossible. Logistically, there's an obstacle there, but Strong Machine J and Natural Vibes is just working right now. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to play with that. Or I guess I wouldn't want to change that rather. Yeah, and it's something that like if that happens then we really are like going on the road to this fans match. Yeah, no, I I I'm I'm all the way on Ishin Ihashi being the guy. I think they're gonna continue that Ishin versus Mochizuki Jr. story. And I think Ishin Ihashi is ready for something new. Yeah, and his gear, it does not look like the kind of gear that's permanent. No, and it looks great, but I, it, it's uh, a, a color change at this point one year into his career would do Ishinihashi some good. Yeah, he could have yellow feathers. It works out. Uh, the main event case is for the Open the Dreamgate Championship. It is Yuki Yoshioka making his third defense against Yamato, returning from his U.S. Uh, vacation here. The biggest match possible for Yuki Yoshioka at this time in it, as champion Yamato, as was uh, brought up a lot of time by the good commentators. He is the ace of the company, and this is his chance to further uh, raise the pedestal of the company if he wins his sixth ever Open the Dreamgate Championship. The, the highest other watermark is four. So he could set himself, he could define himself on a different level with a win here. In case, I think first and foremost, we should just give our predictions here. Does Yuki Yoshioka retain, or does Yamato become the first ever six-time Open the Dreamgate champion? I think it would be a grave error for Yamato to win the belt for the sixth time. Yep, that's where I'm coming from here, and I think that it's something at this point that this is the the important key to get on Yoshioka's belt here. 100%. I mean, this is a match that you really... I, I have such high hopes for this match and such high hopes for Yoshioka. And for as hot and cold as I go on Yamato right now, I think he's on a hot streak, but I think him winning the dream game belt again would be disastrous. I really, I, I almost, I, it's something that I don't think we should really give too much credit for. Cause I don't see it happening. I think the, the purpose of this match is there's going to be fans here that might not have checked out a show in two and a half years it should be a hot building. They crushed it in May in King of Gate. Yoshioka won that. Now Yoshioka is supposedly better. He should win again. Yeah, and it's something that, like, other than the fact that it's Yamato and Yamato's position here, this is a standard defense, I feel like, for Yoshioka. Like, this is not one that, like, then again, I was the same person about this time two years ago, case that definitely thought that Ben K would run through Naruki Doi. So there's always, it, there's the Kai contingency case. The Kai contingency could be in play here. But outside of that, like, yeah, Yoshioka should win here. And the one thing I really want to highlight here, and I think this is probably one of the bold uh, decisions that a company in wrestling has made worldwide this year, was setting up a match between your young champion and the ace of the promotion, and then telling the ace to go on vacation for three weeks, wrestle in America, and do nothing else to build it. They knew they had this match set in stone. They knew what it was. They knew, like, the... You, you know that gift case of the Budokan that was... I think it was supposed to be uh, one of Kenta Kobashi's return, and they they flashed on the LED boards Kenta Kobashi versus Kinsuke Sasaki? Yeah, this yeah. Is, they basically did that and said, that's it, that's the match, and walked away for a month. And I think that is bold, and I think that's confident, and I think that is something that when you know what you have and both a champion and the person that's challenging and where the company is at at this point, that, 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 that is putting all your chips in the middle of the table right there, Case, because they didn't do anything to build this match, and it's this hot. Like, that's, that, that's the thing I was going to say. This, this feels hot, and one of my, you know, one of my critiques with Drangate over the last few years is I, I think they've missed the mark with some Dreamgate reigns, some Dreamgate defenses, and especially some builds to Dreamgate matches and Yamato, y Yamato did more for this match by going away and, you know, wrestling Fred Yehai and wrestling Alex Shelley 
than he could have done in a six-man tag in, in Kobe Sambo Hall. So I'm extremely happy that the build of this match is what it was because, you know, we saw what they could do in May, and I think this match is just going to be this or that match on another level. I I am so into this, and I did not... If you would propose to me in January, hey, Yamato's going to challenge for the Dreamgate belt again in 2022... I, I would have hit you with the Drake meme. No, thank you. Not interested. But this match, I am super into. Yeah, it, and it's something that I think that this break for Yamato, like, it is so cool kind of, like, watching him to do this over the last few weeks, knowing. And this was something that that uh, I'm going to try to get his name right. A A A W Connor, Tyler, Tyler Vols, right? Yes, Tyler Vols, yeah. It was something that, like, him and... And Joe Dombrowski brought Yeah, Joe, like, Joe Dombrowski on the first night, and then I don't remember who was on the second night. Yeah, but it was in that first night they brought up, it's like, hey, Yamato is someone that has this that he's going for in the future. What if he comes in to this, like, with our championship? And, and that was something that once that seed got put in my mind, that was, like, a cool thing that happened during the Prestige match. But the, the point is, is that, like, you have all the stuff here that I think, and it's something that Dragon Gate used to i think do the best of but we don't really like talk about it too much dragon gate used to do these phenomenal pre-match videos i think about the akira tozawa versus bb hulk one in 2014 uh, all the, 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 time. the best the, the best and they're going to have like yamato's like training montage of him uh going grocery shopping with dr keith uh, making food for his friend <laughs> finding all the dirtbag beers in america by the way he did remark when he got back in to japan it's like oh this is uh on discount day with a can of like asahi <laughs> what a man what a man but we're gonna like get like all of this and he's preparing himself to go against the guy who when he beat him in King of Gate, it was not like a – it was an awesome match. It was one of my favorite matches of the tournament, but it was not a – Yoshioka pulled it out by his skin of his teeth. Yoshioka pretty definitively beat Yamato. So seeing like what Yamato takes from this three-week period adds a completely different element to this kind of match that Dragon Gate hasn't done in years, and I'm trying to think if ever, really, to be quite honest. Yeah, I, I, that's that's very well put. This, you know, other than Ishinihashi being the Zebrats member, my my most confident and correct prediction of the year was Yoshioka going over Yamato and King of Gate, and that's exactly what happened. And you're exactly right; that was a definitive win. And it's the only hangup that I have in 100% saying that Yoshioka will win this match. I'm about 98% of the way there, but for him to have two solid wins over Yamato in the same calendar year would really it would really be something, but I think Yoshioka warrants that level of stardom and dominance. You know, this is the guy who, for all of the uncertainty in July, the the awful build to Kobe world, as soon as he beat Kai, and then especially after he beat Minoru the next night, it was all of a sudden I was like, okay, we're good. Everything's okay. Yoshioka's the champion. It has just worked, and he had his downers, and I don't know where they stand on it, but I was bullish on his title run, and it has blown away even my pretty high expectations, and I expect this to be just a, you know another defense for him. He's already had two really strong matches uh, with Minora and with Ata. I expect this to be the same. I it, It's going to be so cool to see this match. So we have the Minora match, which... It did build a little bit off of his title win from Kai, but it very much felt like that they were doing the Kobe World Main Event. That, and then you had the Ada match where Ada conservatively took eighty five percent of the match, and, and and it was only the last five minutes that Yuki Yoshioka won. But the thing was, those were the five minutes that counted. I'm fascinated by what this match might be because I think it's going to be something completely different from King of Gate. I I want to see like if we do not get the body scissors spot here, I'm going to be so personally aggrieved. No, I think I, I think I think Yamato is going to work on top. I think he's going to try to take out the legs of Yoshioka, and I think Yoshioka is going to hit him with a frog splash in the end and get the win. This is one of those matches where it, I don't have match of the year contender expectations for it, but it's also very realistic that it could hit that level. You know what we should start doing for these? Be, uh, we should treat this like how the National Weather Service treats uh, tornadoes. Explain to me what you're talking about. You lived on a farm. I felt like you would understand these things. Well, 
<laughs> you lived on a farm is not a comeback that I was expecting. I've watched the Weather Channel. I've watched the Weather Channel during tornadoes. I'm not pulling the specific reference that you're looking for. So basically, like whenever they do a watch versus a warning, a watch is always saying that there is a chance a warning is there's a it's likely happening right now if there's not already touchdown. I would put a match of the year watch on this. That's Mike, I say this uh as your broadcast partner and as your friend, that is fucking great. That is a great <laughs> analogy that we need to start using more regularly. That oh my god. Okay. Yes. This it, has, it took this me has, a couple of years after the Gentleman's Three to come up with my next great Spears of Asia. That is good. This has matched the year contender watch written all over it. Yeah, and it's something that like intrigues me so much. Like it, it is something that we've seen such creativity around the Dream Gate with a Yuki Oshioka that like this is the easiest match of the year contender watch I could ever issue from the Spears Weather Service. <laughs> this will be really good stuff. Uh I, I'm really excited to see I'm excited to see what the crown is like. You know, who sides with Yoshioka versus Yamato, because it, it would not surprise me if it's 60-40 in favor of Yoshioka. Yeah, because that's one of the things about this being the the first like really like advertised uh, Voices OK show. And it goes along the lines of stuff that we've been kind of picking up like from uh, f- from friends of ours who've been at shows and people within the company. We've been able to kind of discern, OK, who is actually really hot as it counts towards a Dragon Gate fan base, either if it's from merch lines or it's the, hey, have you seen the amount of signs there or have you seen how – on some shows, if it's D. Kirch closing out, everyone's there. Or if it's someone else, then they might have already cleared out that point. We get to see that, like, we'll be able to judge that with our own ears, basically. Like, all the speculation's over about if this generation shift that we think has happened and we think is already kind of completed. Because if this audience is screaming and is doing the Yuki calls that they were doing before Yuki Oshioka left and went to Mexico and came back as Di Inferno and had to be under that heavy, gross mass for so long. If, if these fans are at the at the edge of their seats screaming for them, then we know that this company has completely solidified its next five to ten years. Like, we will know definitively on Sunday. So maybe let's close with this. I, I've got three names in mind as – the big winners in terms of crowd reaction on this show, the the three wrestlers that I think maybe the people that watch the Corkin shows every once in a while for sure watch the big shows that they're going to go, oh, I, I didn't know this was happening. And I think those names are Takuma Fujiwara, Mochizuki Jr., and Yuki Yoshioka. I see those being the three names that people have to take a step back and go, oh, they they are they are over in a way that I was unprepared for. Are, are there any names that you would contest with those? I I would probably when I say Yuki Yoshioka, I'd probably would include the rest of D Courage with him because I think that they you should treat them as an act, and I think that we will see that definitively. I'll be interested in seeing. Because I have the idea, and I've always noticed like snickering from the crowd. I am interested in seeing how much the big boss character is over. I think that that thing could be insanely over. And, you know, to add another name, so I'm not repeating your list, Binke. How can oh, we forget about yeah, Binke with, that's, with that's Chicky, good. Chicky, Chicky? Chicky, Chicky, Chicky. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's another, that's a, that's a good one. So there's just, it, it's one of those things that like I felt like I would come into like this time, you know. I, I guess this is my way of wrapping up the, the show, at least from my side, because uh, I, I thought I'd come into the first show with cheering aloud with a lot of, I don't want to say anxiety, but a lot of questions and a lot of things that I would be keeping an eye on through the show and through the night and looking it back on after like attendance is reported and stuff like that. I thought there would be a lot of things that, you know, to, to pick an emoji, I thought my feeling going into this week in case would be the looking between your fingers and your head while your head is in your hands emoji. I thought that's what we were going to be getting here. But I found myself like just insanely excited and pumped and kind of certain in a way that I did not think I would be. So I I, I can't believe I'm this excited for this kind of show. I didn't think that in this scenario, we'd be just 
bouncing off the walls basically for an hour 45. Yeah, you know, it's it's Battle Autumn this week, and for certain perverts out there, it's the Nick Cage Invitational Weekend. But I, I think when all is said and done, I think this will be far and away the best show of the weekend, and I hope that it gets, you know, it, it will never get the press coverage on the English-speaking side of things that it deserves, but I do hope that the right people pay attention to it and give it some time because I am... I am ecstatic for this show. I think those first four matches are going to fly by, and I think the business end of the card, everything from Ata versus Fujiwara onwards, is going to get a ton of time, and I think it's all going to be really good. Yeah, and I'll say this for folks who aren't necessarily Dragon Gate fans and are or or are fans, but they're like, I can't do this clap crowd thing, or it's just like I want to wait for things to kind of get back to usual here. The fact that they're doing this show like in the first week of the month is actually kind of a saving grace. If you're someone that's like, I I think if this show was put on a pay-per-view with the English commentary on Fight TV for 15 bucks, this show would be a no-doubt purchase and you would be getting every bit of your dollar worth. So the fact that it's on the network at the start of the month, it's like you could try this show out. And for the price that the show probably would still be a massive bargain at for the network. You get that, and if you're sticking around there, you have a cork in a few days, and you want to go back to the Saturday Kobe show that's happening before this, there's a lot there. And I think that this is actually going to be a cool month for people who are wanting to dive into Dragon Gate. For sure. Yeah, so uh, obviously we will have same-day audio from this show. Expect that late Sunday, early Monday morning in your podcast feed and then we'll be back to talk about the Cork and Hall show next Thursday. And then the Tuesday after that, the Noah Drangate uh, show that you and I are both very annoyed about that we'll talk more about later. <laughs> I, I like that we piece that out so we could have like a cork in of good feelings and a cork in that both of us are just going to. And, and I feel like that we are the two people who are like that about, but we'll talk about that. Oh, no, then, if, there's I, people are talking they're like, wait, why are you bothered by the Noah Drangate show? It's like, ah, oh, you don't understand. Like, it's I, the, the Amato's wrestling Seki Yoshioka. It sucks. I, but they're like, why is that a big deal? Like, it just is. I mean, Dragon Gate will, I, I still think will like, I really hope that this show doesn't pull down the cork in attendance two days previous. I, I don't think it will, but it's going to be something that when this Dragon Gate show two days before is going to outdraw this thing. Oh, I yes, I'm I'm completely on board with that. I mean, my, again, my initial view of this show was that it was supposed to be Dragon Gate versus the Noah Juniors, which is part of the reason I got so annoyed because I think that unintentionally belittles Dragon Gate. But to add Kiyomiya to that show just tells me that nobody bought tickets to it. Yeah, and then not changing the show around so you have Ace versus Ace. Well, I, you know what? I, I, I see your point there, but after Sunday, it might be with Yoshioka uh, versus Kiyomiya. Buddy, Sunday, you know what I was doing Sunday? What was that? I was having a delightful time in new orleans i did not I, I i was just completely zoned out at that time i i, I got probably the best piece of cheesecake of my life in new orleans this time. really it was great yeah yeah went to commander's palace that they, they have insane cheesecake I, I love the cheesecake that's my go-to that's my favorite dessert yeah it was like this caramel uh cinnamon number solid oh yeah 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 all right but, but i think that's gonna do it for us this week case unless you had anything else you wanted to add on before we get out of here no i think we're good Yep, that will that's going to do us for this episode, as Case mentioned before. We will be back Sunday. I would expect that to hit your feeds probably, as Case said, Sunday evening into Monday morning with a complete same-day audio. Basically, as soon as I know Case is watching it live, as soon as I'm done watching it, I'm DMing him. We're going to figure out a time, get it out to you. And, and thanks for everyone to kind of stick in, stick with us as we're kind of doing this schedule change here but it kind of ends up that you're getting four episodes in two weeks so that works out as well red circle donation button don't forget <laughs> about it I, i'm gonna need more uh yoga throat coat tea by the or throat comfort tea by the end of these weeks i no 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 no, no. throat coat tea mike that's what it is <laughs> i mean yeah yeah but uh you can follow the the podcast as long as twitter exists in a usable format I open voice gate case we'll have to figure out in the future about uh how well what to feed people there about that but that's a question for other d- another day cases that underscore in your case i'm at fuji Heya. thanks for listening to voice gate we'll be back with you sunday talking about gated destiny 2022 take care everyone <laughs>